Now give them revelation as they hear the word that comes from the man of God that has a heart that's been called to rebuild family and create an organization, Christian Families Against Destructive Decisions. Lord, we know that it was one decision that was made. Life is choice driven and one decision can make a difference, and one decision by our four parents who said that they would choose the knowledge of evil and good, and it's put us in this mess. That if we learn to choose life, we can experience life. Now, I pray today that your spirit will move and that these people will hear from you, that they will make a choice for life, and they will make a choice to share what they hear with others. And Lord, from this group that's tonight in the group, that'll be tomorrow, Lord, you will raise up leaders. You will raise up those who will go forth to labor, to bring people together, husbands in love with their wives, wives in love with their, their husbands and children, submissive to their parents and honoring them. So speak tonight, Lord, and touch the hearts of those that are in this room and touch the hearts of those that will be in the room tomorrow. And, Lord, may we find leaders that are going to embrace, embrace the mission that is before us, that Christian families that are allied together to keep others from making destructive decisions in their families. Lead us now. Lead us, Lord. And may the man of God and the people of God that are here hear from you. We thank you for that now in Jesus' name. Amen. A few months ago, I um, was invited to go to Atlanta to go to a, uh, a conference that was about family. And it was about uh, faith. And I was reluctant to go. And I decided, y'all know I don't go nowhere. I stopped going places. And... Um, and I, and, and I was invited, I saw it by email, and I decided I wasn't going because uh, uh, I just didn't, didn't want to get out there and do anything. Well, that night the Lord spoke to me. He said, you said you're going to be my servant, and you go wherever I want you to go. And so I decided I would go to Atlanta. I didn't want to go, but I was going to go because I felt compelled I had to go. I went to Atlanta, and one of the first things that I did when I went in there, I saw a table on, about CFAD, Christian Families Against Destructive Decisions. And I saw this table about family, and you all know we are family church. We are family. And I went over and I looked at some of the things that they were doing, and I saw that this was an organization that was reaching out, teaching husbands to love their wives, wives to be submissive to their own husbands and children to obey their parents, dealing with issues that have broken our families, that have destroyed the family unit. My wife, as you know, was working on Project Heal. How do we, we end the gun violence that's on the streets? And you go right down to it, it's the breakdown of the family that has caused us to fracture to cause us to begin to turn against one another. When the love is not in the family, then there's love that's nowhere because people don't know how to love because the family, the foundation of society is broken. And if the foundation be destroyed, what are the righteous going to do? We must move forward. We must begin to take charge over what's going on. Satan 
is not victorious. We are victorious. The only reason he gets over is because we don't take a stand. The Bible says, submit unto God and resist the devil and he will flee. But we are not submitting enough unto God to run family and build family the way God said to do it. We got all kinds of ways trying to do family. But anyway, and I saw this, and my heart was touched. And I began to realize my disobedience about not going somewhere was going to cause me to miss this. And then when I saw it, I knew that I'd have to have some connection with this organization. And when I left, I, I, I got away from it. And, of course, Satan said, well, you, you don't want to do this. You don't want to do anything. Just go back to your shell. Be quiet. Don't do anything. And, uh, but I had signed up, and I started getting little correspondence from the organization. I had signed up, and I got a phone call, and I, I didn't know who the phone came from, and they left a message, and, and I, didn't, I didn't respond to that because I was still going to be misbehaving. And you all know when God starts to tell you something, he's just going to get on you, and you, you just have to, you, after a while, you just get, it's like an itch, you know, you just, and so that's, uh, uh, I, I, I had to finally break down and make the connection. And uh, I don't know who got me. I don't know which one of these. The, the apostle is Apostle Quick, and he's got, got a son, that's, uh, and his name is Quick, too. And then he's got somebody else, somebody else. Then they called me again, and I picked up the phone, and it happened to be, yeah, we're calling you from C5. <laughs> and I, oh. But then I got reading more, and I began to realize this is what guiding light needs. But it's not only what guiding light needs, it's what other churches need. It's what families need. And if the church will come together, then we can begin to make a difference. My wife working on Project Heal and, and the kids that are out in the street, what's going on? If we begin to give these kids families, they don't have to become involved in gang families. If we make the family light. And if the people of God don't take a stand, then our society is doomed because the blessings come upon the people of God and says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, and repent, he says, I will heal their land. We need a, we have a nation, we have a state, we have a city that needs healing. In the city of Birmingham, there are murders that go on every day. That's why we started Project Heal, and the Lord said, I got you in Project Heal, and now I'm going to get you with CFAD. I'm going to get you so that you're going to make a difference. And, Lord, I'm going to do all this. I have sent you people that are going to make a difference. Those of you that are here. You have been brought here tonight by the Spirit of God because someone out here is ready to get involved. After you hear the message and the things that you hear, you are going to want to be involved in building family. And Apostle, I don't think you know this, I, I mentioned it on one of my programs, and one brother right back here, um, Brother Joey, immediately contacted me, say, I want to be involved in strengthening family. That's the first, and he's not even a leader in the church, he's just a, a, a man that, that his wife is right there. Joey, stand up, you and your wife should stand up for a minute, I want, the, I want, them, I want this whole congregation to see. His wife works with the children's church, but he's a person that said, when he heard me speak this, he said, I want to do something with it. And when I said, well, uh, uh, what do you know? He said, I've already been out to their website, and that's what I want to do. I want to be involved. Well, thank you, Joy. But he's not the only one. I know somebody, God's going to raise up somebody else in here. He's going to speak to you tonight. He's going to speak to you tomorrow. And just like Joy sought me out, you will do it too. And we're going to make a difference. We will make a difference. We are family, and here we are, going to connect up with somebody, going to help strengthen us with family. We are the guiding light, and we are going to let our light shine so that men might see the work that we do and bring glory to God. I'm going to remind you, and you don't know this, but right outside, we're on one of the high points in the county. We are 960-some feet above sea level, Birmingham's at 600, and right out here, there is ground where water bubbles up, and it flows down here, and we got a stream, and, and some of you all, I'm just reminding you again, 
the water bubbles up out the ground right back up here. It turns into a stream. And we got the lake where the beavers have dammed it up out there now. You see that lake out there. And it flows on down, and it goes down into the creek. It goes in, uh, I can't remember the one, but it's the one that flows out in front of Brookwood. It, but it's going to go to the Cahaba. But it's the, the, uh, the little creek that, uh, that rolls in front of Brookwood. That's not the Cahaba there, but it goes to the Cahaba. But we have one of the, the uh, uh, heads of it beginning out here. So I'm going to say that we've been believing for it, that as that water bubbles up out the ground from right here, may the spirit of the Lord do something that flows from this hill, begins to go into a stream, and from a stream it flows into a river, and then from the Cahaba River it flows down throughout the state of Alabama and flows into the ocean. We know that the revival that has been spoken of is supposed to come from Alabama. It's been said a lot of times that we would have something to do. I'm believing that by restoring our families, we can make a difference. But it's not me by myself. Someone out here is going to be involved. So that's enough for me saying. And uh, I want to give the rest to the apostle. Y'all know my heart. And uh, so I'm going to have uh, Elder Isaac Quick to come up, and he's going to tell you something in the introduction, give you all something about uh, uh, CFAD, and you won't hear from me anymore, and I'm not Pastor Jim, so I just can't summarize it in uh, uh, one or two words. You know, I'm just talking. Apostle, that's one thing about my son. We'll find out about your son in a minute, and uh, uh, <laughs> my son can have, he's, he's a man of a few words, but empathic words, and he doesn't talk as long as I do. He just said, Dad, you don't know when to stop. So I'm going to stop right now, and uh, 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 Elder Isaac, come on up right now. We'll give you the mic here. Well, thank you, Bishop Lowe, and uh, I'm trying to get like your son as well, but I'm not going to be long-winded tonight. Um, we think it's important to, uh, the Bible says, know them that labor among you, and I know that CFAT is new to everybody, and also the man of God that God has put at the helm of CFAT is new to all of you. And so just wanted to take a moment just to talk a little bit about him so that you can know who stands before you. Um, I am his youngest son. I'm Apostle Quick's youngest son, Isaac Quick. His oldest son is here, uh, Elder Joshua Quick, amen. And his son-in-law is here, Sumner Benton, amen. And his daughter is here, uh, Brianna Benton. My wife was not able to be here, and my brother's wife was not able to be here, and our children was not able to be here. Thought it important to mention that because he indeed is a family man. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't preach, uh, but his life doesn't show the fruit of his message. Um, he loves family, and his family loves him. Growing up, watching him in ministry, I never saw a shyster spirit I never saw anyone who was in it for personal gain. I always saw someone who was sacrificing all for the sake of the cause and for the sake of people. Growing up, I always saw someone who just loved people genuinely and loved God. He loved God so much to where we wanted the God that he served. We wanted the, re the relationship with God that he had. We wanted to serve God like he does, so we're all in ministry. I am co-pastor, my brother's worship pastor, my brother-in-law is evangelist, all in the same church, my sister's evangelist. We all are, are working together under our uh, father, and we're not scratching, we're not, we're not fighting, we're not trying. We, we love working with him, and we're, we're, we're asking the Lord to give him 50, 60, 70 more years because we just enjoy him. We enjoy our family uh, element. We have family days where all of us come together, the grandkids can't get enough, especially my youngest boy cannot get enough of his granddaddy. I say all that to say that he is a family man, but he is also a very selfless man. If God has given you something good, when you love people, you want to give them what you have. And in looking at the, the issues that's going on in the world, the Lord would not let him rest until he began to address the problem of family. Um, as far as I can remember, he has always been one that's been innovative. He's always been one that's been fighting for the cause of family. 
And uh, I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to take long, but I just want to give a snapshot of some of his works over the years. He's been in ministry for 40, going on 48 years. He has built three churches, uh, pioneered three ministries over in South Carolina and North Carolina. Um, he has spearheaded multiple family-based advocacy programs, which focus at, at, uh, on at-risk black boys and youth, uh, reading and math advancement, behavioral intervention, uh, the rehabilitation, houses for veterans, elderly and low income, and housing development for first-time homeowners. He actually uh, was the first uh, uh, African-American pastor that we know of, the first pastor actually that we know of that built the subdivision, a 46 housing subdivision that was designed to allow families to experience what it's like to be homeowners for the first time. Uh, he established Positive Direction for Youth, Black Boys of Distinction, which was one of the first all-male black mentoring programs worldwide. You can see them all over the place now, but when we began it, we couldn't find one nowhere. Nothing to pattern it after. SES Tutor, we tutored at-risk children. We, we mentored children of incarcerated parents. Uh, we uh, housed, praise God, and, and rehab houses for the elderly, veterans, and low income. There's been mighty works. He's won many awards and received a lot of recognition for the work that he has done. And truly, there is no one that I know that works as hard and tirelessly day in and day out for the people. And not just members of his church, but for the community at large. About 13 years ago or so, the Lord gave him a mandate. He said, I want you to champion the cause of the family. And since then, there was beginning of the emphasis shift in our church. And he began to host family conferences, not understanding or knowing where God was about to take this mission to. After a while, after receiving prophetic uh, declarations in early two, 2020, God gave him the vision of CFAD. And he pulled together a team of professionals to help steer the CFAD organization in just a short period of time. And if you stick around, not just tonight, but tomorrow morning, you will hear a lot about what we do, what we have done, what we endeavor to do, how we impact churches, how we impact families, how God is already blessing communities and churches as a result of this vision. He has also attended and been traveling all over the place to bring this family message. And God has blessed CFAD to open up in Florida, in South Carolina, North Carolina, Washington, D.C., and various areas. I believe that God has blessed him to be a last-day apostle, and God has gifted him with the gift of the sons of Issachar. Amen. He understands the times and knows what we must do. But that word understanding is very important. It's the word, the Hebrew word benye, which means wisdom and understanding, wisdom and revelation. God has given him wisdom, and God has given him revelation. You need wisdom because that's what's gained over time. And revelation, because that is what is inspired by God. And like Bishop Lowe said, that he's believing God is going to send a revival in Birmingham, Alabama. Well, I'm telling you, God is sending a revival in Spartanburg, South Carolina, where we are. Because God has, has taken understanding, but has given from wisdom and revelation. And, and we've implemented this structure, and God has been doing great things. I want you to please hear what he has to say on today. There's much more I can say about him, but I want you to know that he is a man of God indeed. And I love my father. I love my man of God. There is going to be a brief video that's going to play what individuals are saying about CFAD right before he comes. After that video is concluded, I'm going to ask everybody to please give a hearty hand clap as we receive the founder of Christian Families Against Destructive Decisions, Apostle Tom E. Quick. Let's say amen. amen. I believe with all of my heart that CFAD is an antidote to what, cure, what, what hurts our community. I believe that with all of my heart. I can't tell you that there's any person or ministry that I had scarcely known but felt moved to sow a thousand dollars before this conference. Why? Because I believe that it is good ground. And I believe I want to sow a serious seed in a place where it's good ground because I know that it is going to produce much fruit. And it already has. And so, so, so I truly believe that um, our connection and our partnership with CFAD and the work that you all are doing, which has been operating, as I told, 
uh, First Lady Quick, you guys have truly been flowing in the spirit of excellence from day one, from the time that I met them, from the time that I'm here today. It's just been flowing in the spirit of excellence, and I thank God for that, uh, because that way it lets me know and it lets the people know back in Washington, D.C., that truly, indeed, we are a part of a great movement uh, that we need to sweep across this nation. So, God took this man of God and gave him something that is unlike anything else that's out there with biblical solutions challenging the enemy no one gets them all and God in mercy has raised up another arm to reach out and to touch people and then he's bringing ministries together and you are fortunate we are fortunate I want to say to this local congregation, you are fortunate to be ground zero for this move of God. And I believe that CFAT in part exists to maintain and to preserve the true identity of what God said a family was meant to be. Because the right vision will bring things around the way God intended for them to be. And God has made CFAD a trustee of the vision that he preordained for family. Because God is separating the wheat from the chaff, the sheep and the goat, and he's exposing. And it's going to be the remnant. And I believe with every ounce of my being that I am standing here only because of God. Because he open the doors and you all are the remnant and I thank you I thank you for being the remnant so I'm trying to help you to understand that CFAD is necessary for every area in our nation and world because CFAD is answering really the most critical problems that we're having in our society we already know I'm so excited about CFAD and the opportunity that brings CFAD to my community and what CFAD have done, my God, what CFAD have done have given us an instruction manual, even though we have the Bible to guide us. But many young people and many families don't even dock in the doors of a church. They don't have instructions. But what we have right now is a light that we can lift up. The scripture says in Matthew, the fifth chapter, let your light shine. CFAD's light will be shining in my community. And I'm grateful to be a part of this great move, Christian families against destructive decisions. In Matthew 5 and 13, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savior, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of man. But I come to tell you today for these few minutes, I will not be trodden under the foot of man. Why? Because of CFAD. CFAD has now given us the flavor and has given us the ability to hold back corruption. Families, as someone said earlier, touch every area of society. Their strengths and weakness to a large degree determine the strengths and weaknesses of churches and communities. As goes the man, not only does it so go the family, but so goes the household, so goes the community, so goes the church, so goes, my God, the city, so goes the state, so goes the nation, so goes the world. That's why we need CFAD so that we can have a pushback in the Holy Ghost. God bless you tonight. Let us pray. Father, in the precious name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, God, we love and thank you for your goodness, for your tender mercies, for your loving kindness. 
We thank you for the privilege of standing in this place that we've never stood before, gathering with your people to contemplate, Lord, what is most dear to the heart of God. And we believe that to be the family. We ask tonight, God, that you would have your way. God, that you will speak the words that you desire to speak. Convey the thoughts, emotions, and understanding and wisdom that you desire to convey. And have the effect upon each of us, God, that you purpose. And let us all respond in a responsible manner to take upon the mantle and to enter into this great battle for the very souls of men and the souls of our nation. I thank you for this great man of God, Bishop Jim Lowe. For all that you've invested in him in wisdom and power and anointing and vision. For his wife and for his son and for the great members of this church and all of its officials. And everyone tonight that was created by God. I pray your anointing and blessing in their lives and families. In the name of Jesus we pray. Now Lord touch me tonight. For truly without you I am nothing and can do nothing. I am the least of all. God, you've chosen the least, and I present myself tonight that you might use me for your glory and for your honor. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Would you please give the pastor a big hand tonight? God bless you, men of God. We honor you, and we thank you so much for the privilege of being here tonight. And I uh, I want to say in remarks tonight, thank you, sir. Amen. What did I do without you? <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. I want to say tonight, first of all, I'm just, as I came upon the grounds uh, tonight, the campus or the city, however you want to call it, I was completely blown away. And as I rode up, I said to my family, I said, man, look what God has done through CFAD. <laughs> <laughs> Just a short while ago, uh, I was in a low, very low place. Uh, the Lord set me down after 40 some years of ministry, and he took me to a place where I never thought that I would be. But while I was there, instead of him availing himself and allowing me to have a lot of emotions that I would have to fast and pray to get rid of, God caught my attention, and he put CFAD in my heart. And I came out of that situation, and the Lord kind of said, don't look at what you're leaving behind, but look at what you're leaving with. And I left with something that inspired me when I was thinking about retiring. After 40 some years of ministry, my daughter had told me, she said, Daddy, anybody that's been doing anything as long as you've been doing this has retired already. <laughs> and so I had retirement in my mind, but uh, the Lord had something else in mind. And he said, I raised up your son to assist you in pastoral ministry so you'll be free to do something that he can't do yet. But because of your years and because of your age, I can use you to do it. And that was CFAD. And so I'm grateful tonight to be here. I certainly honor you, sir, and thank you for the confidence and trust that you have exhibited on having just met me and talked to one of the elders in our church, and you and I talked briefly and I think our hearts were knit together, and we found out we were like-minded, and, uh, uh, and I thank you for following the leading of the Lord. Uh, as I acknowledge, uh, the challenge that we have today uh, comes on, uh, it comes in succession to other challenges that we've had as humans, and in many cases as a, ra as a race of people. And, uh, but the challenge is the same regardless of whether we are one race or another, the challenge is to preserve what is most dear to God and what's most beneficial to us and what is under attack today, and that's our families. That's our family. So, sir, thank you, amen, and thank you for the privilege and thank you for being able to lock arms with you, and I will sing your praises everywhere I go, amen, for you are a phenomenal man of God. I want to thank the Lord tonight for my wife, First Lady Valerie Quick, God bless her. Would you give her a big hand tonight? We are soon be celebrating 38 years of marriage, and she's the mother of these three wonderful children, and I say that uh, with all sincerity. God has really blessed me. And I, somebody asked one time, 
about my family, and I said, well, I can't write a book about it. It's just God's goodness. God just graced me. I, don't, I can't say do this, do that, and the other. Uh, God just blessed us, and we're grateful for them. I'm grateful you, you heard from my uh, co-pastor, Elder Isaac Quick. My older son is here, Elder Joshua Quick, who is our worship pastor and a mighty man of God, a excellent Bible teacher, and also a tremendous entrepreneur, and uh, I love him dearly. And uh, I, was, I was riding over, I looked at him, and I, I thought my wife is sitting behind me, and my son is on the other side of me, and any one of them could do a much better job than I'm going to do tonight. And so I thought, wow, what kind of pressure am I on? <laughs> <laughs> to our district missionary, I am, I am uh, presently uh, in the Church of God in Christ. I went to the Church of God in Christ some seven years ago to help a lifelong friend of mine who became a, uh, a jurisdictional prelate establish a new jurisdiction. He asked me to come, and I've been working with him for seven years, and because I was, I had to organize a district. And so I chose this young lady, District Missionary Jasmine Gorey, to be our district missionary. And she's here tonight, and she is a wonderful young lady in the Lord, and we thank God for her. Amen. So would you give all of them a big hand? My daughter is here. My son-in-law is here. He's the big guy that walked up and put, uh, and, and put my stuff up here, and he... Uh, he's a church evangelist and a tremendous preacher, and he can sing. I mean, I, if I had turned him loose here tonight, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have got out of here. Amen. He's, he's, an, he's, an, he's anointed. And then three of my 11 grandchildren. Would y'all stand? Would y'all stand? There's uh, Anaya. She's the only girl. Amen. And uh, she is, uh, uh, she's my sweetheart, and she is my heart. And I often tell the story. I'm not going to tell it tonight for sake of time. Amen. And then there's Alex. Amen. That's the junior. He's Sumner Alexander Jr. And then there is Elijah Eugene. He shares my middle name. So would you help my, bless my family tonight? God bless them. I am grateful for them. Now, I'm going to try to do this. I want to say to you, I want to encourage you that this is a, this, this is a two-part presentation. If you miss tomorrow morning, you'll probably miss something that you sh should not have missed. Okay? I, I wish I could do it all at one time, but if I did, I don't know that we would dig any hole deep enough. I don't think we could put a seed in any hole that I could dig deep enough if we did it all at one night. So on tomorrow, we're going to actually take a look, and there are going to be presentations by others uh, we're going to present the programs, the resources, and the strategies of CFAN. So we're going to open the hood up, and we're going to look at the spark plugs, and we're going to look, praise God, amen, at the motor, and we're going to take a look at the oil and make sure that it's checked, it's full, and all of that. So when it's all over, we'll kind of know something about the condition and what really makes it work. Tonight, I want to talk about the driving force behind it, and where I believe it is in, as it pertains to the heart of God. So there are a few scriptures tonight that I would like uh, us to look at it, look at before we get started. I think there are scriptures that will elevate family, amen, as the Lord revealed it to me. The Lord told me very emphatically that family is the heart of God, that God's heart is in family. When I see him in creation and I see him on the sixth day and he is prepared to do uh, the greatest, make the greatest uh, part of creation itself. He made a man. And in the process of making man, the result of it was he produced a man of uh, what it would take in order to establish family. Amen. He, he did not quit until he gave man a woman and he said it's not good for man to be alone. So in other words, a man alone is not good. And so we can never become individualistic because as individuals, as we pursue our goals, as we seek to live the best life we can, amen, at the expense of those around us, God says, not good, amen. It's only good for man whenever he has a woman. And he made a woman and brought him to her, and the man was pleased. 
Amen. So God just set it up, and then God told him what to do. He didn't leave him without something to do. He told him, he said, all right, now I want you to, uh, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. So God then speaks or prophetically proclaims the family that did not exist, but that would soon come into the earth. And the Lord set some things in motion because he said, be fruitful and multiply, which meant, and he said, and what? And fill the earth. Then family was to continually exist and continually multiply. And God would continually think on family. And God would set down the rules that would maintain family and sustain the human race. I want to say from the outset that when the Bible declares that the devil comes to kill, to steal, and destroy, it means just that. The devil's desire is not just my individual death or your individual death. The devil's desire is to eradicate the human race. He wants to get rid of mankind. He does not want us on the earth. And so his plan from the beginning was to figure out how he could get God to curse man get rid of man, and when that didn't work, even when he was trying to get Baal and Balaam all involved, when that didn't work, he said, well, if we can get them to fornicate, commit adultery, it will result in the same thing because it will result in the undermining of God's perfect plan, which was a healthy family that reproduced itself and produced godly seeds so God could then return them to the bliss and blessedness that God won't. Today, amen, we are experiencing the, that, that strategy, we see it, that strategy that was, that was suggested that if you, if you just get them to fornicate, commit adultery with these strange women, God would curse them. And I think that when we see the breakdown of the family, we see the redefinition of the family, and now the redefinition of man, and what is a woman? Yesterday they crowned, amen, uh, the International Day of the Women crowned transgender men as the epitome of what it means to be a woman. Oh, yeah, they, brought, they flew them in from Argentina and everywhere and gave them the presidential award for being women. We have a problem. We have a problem. Let's look at just a couple of scriptures. We want to look at, first of all, Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18 and uh, verse 13 through 19. And I am like your pastor, and so I'm going to try to practice some self-control tonight, all right? Praise the Lord. My, my wife warned me when we were leaving. I said, you know, I had a dream, and she said, when you preach too long? <laughs> and I said, no, that wasn't it, but she got, she got it in there. Praise the Lord. I fell on my knees and praised the Lord. <laughs> the Bible says in the 13th verse, And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child, when am old, which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. Verse 16. And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? All right. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord and do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken unto him. The first thing I want to acknowledge and I want to say to you is that Abraham, we often say, was chosen because of his faith. The Bible says that Abraham was chosen because of his dedication to his family. God said, I know him 
that he will command his children after him, that they will keep the way of the Lord. That's why I'm going to keep my promise to him. Faith alone was not the reason for his choice. And the blessing of Abraham is not just the result of faith. It's the result of dedication to family, to parenting, to teaching our children to keep the way of the Lord. All right, let's go from there to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28. And verse 13 through verses 15. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. Now, we're two generations away now. We're, we're two generations away. Why would God even bother to mention Abraham and in, mention Isaac? Today, he wouldn't have to because in many cases, whenever our children talk to God, they would never give a last name. You ever ask him, say, what's your name? Sam. Well, do you have a last name? Because the generations are so quick to separate themselves, to be ashamed, to divide. But in the scripture, it is the will of the Lord that there be generational heritage and links. And so he says here, he said, I am the Lord thy God, uh, the God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, who uh, you know, and the land whereon uh, thou liest, to thee I will give it and to thy seed. So the, the work of the Lord is not just in your and my generation, but if we're truly in tune with God, we have to think generationally. We have to think beyond our own accomplishment, our own pleasure, what we want in our lives and think how it's going to connect, effect, praise God, prosper, amen, or damn or curse the generations that follow us. At the same time, we must honor the sacrifice, the labors of those that went before us. All right? He said, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families. I just discovered Abraham's whole purpose. That great man of God did not exist for his own aggrandizement. He is only great because God dedicated him to blessing families, not individuals, not races, families. The only significant minority is a family. Not a race. And behold, he said, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places, whether thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Now, I want to propose that if we align ourselves with God's eternal purpose, which we've gone back now beyond our own history, we've gone back now beyond uh, this great city, this, this city uh, which was known as the Johannesburg uh, of America. We've gone back beyond, uh, you know, the various things that we are, so things that when I was a child, I watched on TV and I saw images and I heard things that caught my attention as a child and uh, marveled that such things would happen, but also marveled at the courage of individuals in Birmingham. But we got to go back beyond that. That was just a moment in time. That was just, that was a, his, a history, uh, a historical moment that we won't forget, but we can't, we can't anchor ourselves in that because that does not define us. Doesn't define any of us. Birmingham without name existed when God was dealing with Abram. This land was here. That stream was probably bubbling. <laughs> so we got to go back. We got to go back. If we're going to ever hook it up right, we got to go back. And if we go back, what we hear God saying here, if you fall in line with my eternal purpose, I will never leave you. 
and I will do that that I have promised that I'm going to do for you. And that's as good for me because the blessings of Abraham have come upon me when I position myself with the cause of Abraham. Are you, are you all with me here? Now tap somebody and say, I've got blessings I haven't tapped into yet. Hey. Isaiah chapter 58, which is the foundational scripture for CFAD, is the one that the Lord put in my heart and uh, ministered to me over and over and over again. Every time we fast, my people heard this. <laughs> Amen. But then there came a day when a certain portion of it hit me. And the Bible says here in 58 and 12, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places, this next verse, and thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. That's a reference to restoring the family. It's a reference to an activity, a movement, a pouring out of ministry, pouring out of self, emptying ourselves in a cause, in a purpose. And God said that purpose is going to be at some point a group are going to come together and they're going to realize the importance of the family and they're going to restore, build again, strengthen the foundations for the coming generations. Instill it once again with biblical faith. Form it according to biblical blueprint. Function according to biblical mandate. A group of people who are going to say, I'm not going to be progressive. I'm not going along with all this modern stuff. God cannot be modernized. The word cannot be changed. A man is a man. A woman is a woman. Marriage is right. Everything else is sin. And if it's wrong for me, it's wrong for you. If it's best for me, it would be best for you too. A people who are going to be unmovable and who are going to refuse to compromise and are going to have a definite purpose and a definite vision for all of their life. I live to restore the foundations of the generations. You know why? I'm tired. There are certain things that have wearied me. There are certain things I can't overlook, I can't blink at, and I can't ignore. I'd rather be working, amen, to move what seems to be an immovable mountain than to sit there and let it fall on me. And so God says in the verse prior to that, and the Lord, see, once you're devoted to this, he said, and the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a water garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not, and then they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste place. So God is going to bless us to be a blessing. Now, if you read the entire chapter, it tells you incrementally what God wants from us as a church. And I trust that you will do that. Get Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 6 because this is a significant verse. It's the last verse of the last chapter of the last book of the Old Covenant. 
And after God spoke this last word, God became silent. And I believe that the reason God was silent was because he had promised that he would no longer destroy all living flesh. I believe the reason God didn't send him 400 years because of the rainbow, the God, the Bible, the, the God's rainbow. Because when you read Malachi, you hear him talk about men and how they mistreated the wives of their youth. You hear the indictment, praise God, about lawlessness and oppression and even preachers that weren't doing what they were supposed to do. And so God says, all right, this is the deal. You, I'm going to send Elijah. Let's read it. He said, and uh, behold, fifth verse, behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, that was not the coming of Christ. He said, and, you shall and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. That, that's, he's still talking about family. He's talking about restoring family. He's talking about, amen, he, God realized that family would, would be attacked from every side. He knew that Hugh Hefner was going to release porn to poison the hearts of men and turn them from faithfulness to their wives and loose women. Oh, Y'all know him. He knew that Planned Parenthood was going to attack the woman and tell her that her body was her own, even though he told her that her body belonged to her husband and his body belonged to him to her, and that she could do what she wanted to do. He knew that uh, they were going to call the fetus something other than a baby. God, he knew all, nothing, nothing surprises God. He knew that our sons, if not properly raised, would live in the same communities and get up, and your son would shoot and kill my son, or my son would shoot and kill you your son, a reenactment. He knew that one man would put in another man a chemical that would give him complete control over that man's life as he pursued another dose. God knew that the feminists would come along and teach that marriage was oppression of women and that women needed to go in the community and get out in the corporate world so that they could uh, actualize that to be home raising children and keeping house was beneath them. And so God said, oh, here's the deal. I'm going to send Elijah and you all are going to pick up this mantle and you're going to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the children back to the fathers or I'm going to come and I'm going to smite the whole earth with a curse. You either are going to give your children a daddy <laughs> and give your daddy children that love each other and build your house or else I'm going to smite your community with a curse. Now, here's what I take from that. What I take from that is, is no need of me blaming the Republicans. No need of me blaming the Democrats. No need of me blaming the school system. No need of me blaming the justice system. No need of me hating the police. Huh? No need of me getting all upset with the feds and where they put the interest rates. Because they are not really the problem. The problem is God is not pleased. Because the family is not doing what God ordained the family to do. And while men would like to discourage us from seeing the real problem, 
by causing us to look, look at this and look at that and blame this, blame white folk and blame black folk and blame the folk on welfare and blame this. And he wants to keep us all torn up so we won't look again to the hills from which cometh our help. That we won't see that God has given us power. See, the day that someone else's decision is more valuable than my decision, I'm a victim. The day that I can say because of what they did, I can't do what I want to do, then I've lost anyway. And since I've lost, there's no need in trying. So the game we have today is to take it out of God's hand and put it in politics. But I'm going to tell you something. I fare well regardless of who the president is. Because my God is the same in every administration. And I believe that as a people of God, if we would just realize that we are powerful individuals. First of all, I want to say that tonight. Just like I tell my, you know, we, drug addicts are being delivered in our ministry. And I tell them, all you got to do is take that power and turn it around. So you're a drug addict by your own power. You made the decision. See? Regardless of where I am, it's a result of the decision I made. You can, I can blame you for making it, but I made it. <laughs> which meant that I am here by my own power. God gave me that power. And if I want to be someplace else, I just got to make different decisions. And those decisions have got to be made on better information. Because my decision is never better than the information upon which I use to make it. So when I go to the word of the Lord and I realize that God is sent forth the spirit of Elijah and that the latter day, the New Testament ministry really is, listen, restoring family. And I, I'll say this, and I, I'll say this very humbly, but I realized the other day, the Bible is so grand and so marvelous and so wonderful until we can go in there and find any number of little areas of ministry that we can get into and we can just do a whole lot of stuff and, you know, occupy the Jesus come. We can do prosperity today and healing tomorrow and, <laughs> you know, and, and it's all in the word. But, but what has God said in Malachi, what did he say the New Testament was going to be about? He said it's going to be about restoring the family. And that is the biblical mandate. Now, if I didn't have the Bible and you didn't have the Bible and we... Uh, looked at the statistics, the Birmingham City statistics. I have them right here. And we looked at the state of the family in Birmingham. We would know what God is calling us to do. Hmm. Married. 24.90% black. 36.80% white. That, that's 24.90% that's 24, 24 of eligible black women, black people, are married. 39.7% of eligible, no, 36.80% of eligible whites are married. That's right. And uh, Hispanics do a little bit better than any of us. 40% married. Education. Of 116,000 blacks over the age of 25, 16,000 have bachelor's degrees. That's 100,000 without. That's 100,000 over 25. High school, 71%. Uh, and that, that's good, but when you look at the income 
based upon their education, you understand why our families are having such a hard time. Because if you, without high school, you're looking at somewhere between uh, 14 and 23, with high school, somewhere between 21 and 30, but with a bachelor's degree, amen, uh, a high school diploma, you're looking at somewhere between 26 and 30, but when you get up to a bachelor's degree, you're looking at somewhere between 41 and 54. Economics. Somehow or another are comparable to marital status. As a matter of fact, according to these statistics, a single person is twice as likely to be in poverty than a married person. And children are more likely to be in poverty when they're with in a home that is not intact. Now, these are just facts. Men talk about facts, but God talks about causes. We produce the facts. The facts is just a matter of study. It's a matter of statistics, statisticians. Look at what's happening. But if we want to understand what, why it's happening, we go to God's word. Because God is the one that makes it happen. I'm, I'm, I'm just about done. We do have a PowerPoint. But I wanted to lay the foundation tonight because what I want to say uh, to us all is that Malachi, as well as the conditions that we see, stick to the point that God needs us to rise up and make family and listen, our own family, but more than our own family, but influencing, influencing, amen, the building of strong families and strong generational heritages. I won't even talk about the lonely elderly. I won't even talk about the women who have who struggled for a lifetime uh, with children and grandchildren only to be, they can't get nobody to, come, to call and come see about them. I won't, won't even, won't go there. God wants us to influence, he wants us to use our time, our energies, our anointing, that spirit, that Holy Spirit that we've got to influence a community, a city, to get busy restoring the foundations again. Now, the Bible says concerning the sons of Issachar in 1 Chronicles 12, 32, they understood the times. And I believe that, I know that, that Bishop Lowe does understands the times and knows what we should do. Then we find that Jesus rebuked his disciples because of the Pharisees. He said, because you can look at the sky and you can discern what the weather going to be, but you don't know what time it is. You don't even know what you ought to be doing. You don't know what's important. And, and what's important is, first of all, uh, what I do. Can y'all do that? Come on, say what I do. It is so important to God. You know why? You're in a family. You know what you can't divorce? Go to the North Pole. And when you get there, they will still be in your mind. And either when you think about them, you'll get mad <laughs> or you, you get sad because they ain't there. But you're going to feel something. Out of sight is not out of mind with family. A strange child, cross town, out of town, whatever, is heavy on your heart. You know why? Because God put it there. It's important to him. So we've got to do what the Lord would have us to do in this hour. And Jesus said, you can't even, you don't even know what you should be doing. And I'm excited I just say this, Bishop, I'm so excited to meet you because the prophecy was that God was going to, churches were going to come. This, it was going to become a movement. It was going to become a pouring out. You, you prayed it tonight. You, you talked about it beginning and so forth, and it, is, it has begun, and, and it's happening. And, and I'm so grateful for what God is doing and how he is moving. So we're going to look at this quickly. I'm going to run through this tonight. 
Amen. And we're going to be out here in just a few minutes. But if you would go to slide number two, well, actually, you can skip that. You can skip, amen, the next slide. I want to go to a slide that says mission critical. Where is it at? Praise the Lord. That's right. Come on again. One more time. Right there. Go back one. All right. I say that family is mission critical. <clears throat> to be critical is to be vital. It's vital to the functioning of an organization. Failure or disruption of mission critical factors will result in serious impact on a business, on operations, upon an organization, or, and even can cause social turmoil and catastrophe. I'm saying that the failure of our families and our mission to families is so critical that all of society will fall apart and we'll see men losing their mind. Well, we do see men losing their mind, don't we? When you need to be a biologist to know what a woman is. <laughs> Amen. You lost your mind. <laughs> right? Uh, so, so family is mission critical. I found out, I knew what a woman was. I found out early. My mother <laughs> was a woman. Right. And I found out that women have some mighty back hands. <laughs> 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 Amen. And, and you know what? I thank God for it. Amen. So, so we say family, everybody say mission critical. And without embracing this mission, catastrophe awaits us. Next, next screen, please. All right. I want to look at this for a moment. I want to look at congregational life cycles. And the reason I do that is because, the reason I want to do that is because I'm here and because of my own personal experience. Something that the Lord uh, taught me years ago, Bishop, I had, I lost some folk. Folk walked out, uh, left me in a wilderness. I mean, when I say, uh, I, I, I know what it is uh, whenever, you, whenever you're concerned about having enough resource and everything. One thing I want to say, I found out it don't mean that God left. <laughs> you understand? Don't mean God walked out. Sometimes it has a deeper meaning. And that's what I found out. I found out that in the in the congregational life cycle, there is something called birth. Now, birth, whenever we, when it's born, there are some factors that are very powerful at the time of the birth of a ministry. And I, and I, I know when mine was born, I didn't really have many people, won't no real relationships. There wasn't any really programs in place. There weren't really any man managers because we want nothing to manage. What I had at the time that my ministry was birthed, I had a vision. And I, I took that vision to the people and I said, this is what the Lord is calling me to do. And I preached the word of God as hard as I could. And people came in and they embraced the vision, whether the vision was just to have a church or the vision was to mentor boys or whatever it was. They embraced the vision. And after so many people had embraced the vision, then we grew into the place, what we would call, uh, amen, adolescence. Y'all got to help me with this. Praise the Lord. What's, what's the next one? Amen. We grew into, into a place of adolescence. And at that stage of growth, we found, praise God, that there was something added to the vision. And what was added to the vision was we started adding programs. We started putting things together in such a way. Now look down at birth. You see, you got a little V, a big V, that's vision. You got a little relationship because people are just getting to know each other. You got very little programs because you got to find people to make those programs operate. You got to find some leaders. And you don't have much to manage. You just need somebody to count the little offering. <laughs> Take it to the bank. Somebody unlock the door, turn the lights on, clean the bathroom before church starts. <laughs> you know, and that's part of pretty much. Then as you become an infant, you reach, you start forming relationships around over that vision. 
All right? People get to sing together. They get to slapping hands. They get to be friends. They'll, this different kind of atmosphere comes into church. Still don't have much programming to put together. Preaching is the main thing, man. Very little management. Don't need offices. Don't need nobody in the office every day. Nobody coming by. Nobody calling. As you get to childhood, you start developing programs and it becomes more formal. People began to wear titles. I'm this. I'm that. You're that. <laughs> you, know, he said, you sit there. I sit here. Relationships began to suffer. Are y'all there? Amen. The program now is the thing. And yet it doesn't take much management because most of the people running the program are trusted and they do what's supposed to do. As you continue to grow, then you get into adolescence. At that point, you begin uh, to value relationships more. All right? So you got great vision. Strong relationships. People have been together a long time. God has been weeding folk out as they come. <laughs> Are they right? Some come, some go. All right? Then your programs get strong now because people got good relationships. So you got good, 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 good vision, good relationships, good programs, but still management. See, so I don't know why management is almost the last thing, really, to get a lot of focus. But when you become an adult, look at what happens. You got good vision, good relationships, good programs, good management, and you ride along for a while. And everything gets to be like clockwork. Vision is less important because we have attained the mountain. <laughs> we're doing what works. We're doing it well. And there's no need in changing nothing. And the Lord come along and say, you know what? You've done so well. You've been so faithful over a little. I think I, I want to put you over something else. But wait a minute, Lord. Things are going pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I, I have a great assignment for you. You've done so well with that. I, I, I got something a little bit closer to my heart. But Lord, all right, well, if you don't want to, then now all you have is relationship, <laughs> huh? programs, and management. But the vision that I wanted to give you, you refused. Then the next thing is the empty nest days. We're talking about human. It's just like a human thing. Grown folks start leaving. <laughs> Programs start suffering. Because <laughs> grown folk follow you. They follow vision. So vision is gone. Relationships is pretty strong. But then the people who are not as great in relationships, they began to let you down and the program begins to suffer and management comes a real problem. And then as things began to decline even more, vision is gone, relationships are really rocky and we're left dealing with programs and trying to manage with what's left. I can say this because I've been there. And what I learned is this. When the Lord allows me to go there, when God let me go there, what I had failed was that the Lord was trying to change my direction, and I didn't hear him. But he knew that what I needed was to come back over here. Uh, can can y'all see that? And I needed to get the vision that he wanted to give me for that season. And then instead of dying over here, I'm rebirthed over here. And now I start building new relationships 
developing my program differently. And then I go around the cycle. Now, what I want to propose is that Tom Quick knows about this. Because one day I woke up and I said, God, are you through with me? <laughs> and the Lord said, I want to reveal something to you. But the money was good. And the folk loved you. And you were known for what you were doing. And you know what I told my church? We're finna start a new church right where we are. The only thing about it, when I started before, I just had my wife and three little children. Now I got y'all. I didn't have no building. I said, but now we got 18 and a half acres. And we got this facility. That's what I told them. I said, we're going to work with our mission statement. We're going to redo our. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just saying, we're going to redo this thing. And we start all over. And then I said, now, some of y'all are still hurting because of the people that left us. I said, some of y'all can't trust nobody no more. You're, too, you're scared to get close to folk because they said they won't never leave you. <laughs> and now new folk coming in and you're going, hmm, we better wait and see what they're going to do before we go to putting our arms around them. <laughs> Amen. So I told him, I said, I tell you what we're going to do. Let's forgive all them people. Let's realize that they left their portion with us. That the ground that we are worshiping on, they helped pay for. <laughs> that the building we're in, they, they helped pay for. When they were here, when they were submitting to our pastor, they helped us get here. Let's thank the Lord for them. Let's pray that God bless them. Lord, take them on to heaven if you want to. <laughs> we love them. We praying for them. And when we see them, we're going to say, hey, baby, how you doing? Oh, it's so good to see you. Hey, glory to God. And my God, my church got delivered. <laughs> Hmm? And we grew. And we grew. And we're still growing. And guess what? Some of them want to come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, what they don't know is they can come back. But they don't think they can come back. Because they ran their mouth when they left. And they think we know what they said. <laughs> we don't care what they said. Come on back. But wait a minute. You, not, not up here now. You start back there. And the Lord is just testing, was just testing us to see if we were perfected in that area. To see if we trusted him or if we trusted our rulers. And, and I'm going to tell you, through a process, through that process, there was almost a spontaneous overnight change in the atmosphere of our worship services. We didn't have to talk about the folk that left no more. We could trust people that God was sending in. We heard the word with gladness. It was easy on me because I was trying to make folk happy. And I wasn't all the way happy myself until the Lord delivered me and showed me how to do it. I was like, I had to get it together myself. So I want to I wanna say that when, 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 when Bishop Lowe and I met and he, he was enthused about it. And I knew, I knew the challenge. I know the challenge 
of, of doing something new, bringing in somebody new, bringing in something. See, I, I knew that. I prayed for him. And I said, Lord, let him, just let him give him the courage to do it because I believe it'll bless him. You know, but that's an that's a issue that I have. I'm having, you know, across the country. People are just, it's, it's new. It, it's a cultural shift. But it's a response to where our nation is right now. It's a direct response to where we are. It gives our people something to talk about, too. It gives us something to wish, wish, witness to. It gives us a compassion, an understanding of people and their challenges. It, let us, it, it leads to a, a loving concern that is like nothing else I've ever seen before. Compassion is a key to the kingdom. Jesus was moved by compassion. So the famine. Next slide, please. So there's a threefold mission for the family. I, we're going to run through this. We're going to get a lot tomorrow. Next slide. Number one, Genesis 126. And God said, let us make man in our image <laughs> and in our likeness. <laughs> and let's give him dominion. <laughs> Is this a test? <laughs> Of the, oh, and and let, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God wants marriage through marriage and family. He wants us to subdue the earth and fill it with his glory. Number two, redemption. God wants the family to be an instrument of redemption. We have mistaken the church for that. We, we think that it's the church's role to redeem the world. God, Lord have mercy, he wants your house to be a sanctuary. And he wants you and your wife's relationship to be a picture of his and the church. He wants you to disciple your children. And he wants the church to help you to do that. But he does not want you to give the church the responsibility of doing it. God rather have all y'all employed than just one. <laughs> all right. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord has said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee and I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that cursed thee. And in thee all families of the earth shall be blessed. There again, Abraham's call was to bless families. That's what we're called to do. We're Abraham's sons. Move on. Next one, please. Third is restoration of all things. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive under the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Matthew 17, 11, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias, or Elijah, truly shall first come and restore all things, that is, bring back and found us on the foundations that God established in Genesis. He's going to restore marriage and family. Next, next. So the only significant minority is the family. The only significant minority is the family. Now, there's a lot to be said, but just gather that. Just believe that tonight. Encircle yourself. Now, I know that God talks about households, families and households. And when somebody's in your household, praise God, that you treat them like family. All right? They don't have to be blood, but they're part of your household. They become a part of your immediate family. That circle is the only significant minority. When the Deaf angel came by. Deaf angel coming by. God said, hey, man, you, come here. You too, man. You too, man. You too, man. Get you a lamb. Slay it. Put blood on the doorpost. Take your family in there and close the door and don't come out. The only significant minority is the family. If we're going to put blood on the doorpost and this devil that's in the air is not going to destroy us, we have to go in with our families. When COVID came, even the government told you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
go home. <laughs> Am I right? And what did God tell him that night? Go home. Shut the door. If you get caught out, you're in trouble. The significant minority is the family. My health is caught up in these people. My peace is caught up in these people. My welfare is caught up in these people. And if I don't do them right, they'll keep me up at night. Where that crazy boy at? What is he doing? I hope he don't get killed out there. <laughs> That's just that real. All right? So family is it. Next slide, please. I'm, I'm rushing. Uh-oh, look at the perversion in society. Think them houses are going to stand? They need a foundational fix. The breakdown of the family results in greater multiplied lawlessness. The education system and inter entertainment industry has slowly groomed the generation into this new perverse anti-Christ philosophy of family. Next slide. With the breakdown of marriage, the children are subjected to rebellion, wrath, and waywardness. Daniel 7 and 25 says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. Redefine marriage. Redefine all this stuff. The Bible tells it all. Next, next, next. Uh-oh. Perversion in society, obsession with sex, fraudulent science has released a catastrophe revolution. Did you hear lately that a man can have a baby? Did you see the show of the boy, the trans, the trans boy, calling himself a girl, having a monthly, had on a heat pack? Now, if you buy that, I got some land in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> That's fraudulent science. Next, next, next one. There's a family meltdown because there's a campaign that has been going on to destroy the family. I don't need no man. If you don't, stop sleeping with him. That's a little blunt, but that just proved you're wrong right there. You lied. <laughs> Next verse. It's getting late. <laughs> Bishop Lowe, I told you you were going to show up. <laughs> All right. School shortages. Schools have been sabotaged. Radicals have hijacked the American school system. They're teaching CRT. They're asking the little babies, do you feel like a boy? You know, how you feel. I know you, I know you, they, they, you, uh, you were assigned. At birth, you was assigned this, but is, does your body and your mind say the same thing? Any child is going to be in confusion when you start that. What does that got to do with reading and writing? Thank you. Oh, okay. Schools are hijacking and messing up our, 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 our children. And we sit back, and the school won't even tell you whenever your child changes his pronoun. They, they, they can't even, uh, one of the teachers came and told me and said, look, they, they, we can't even call the parent and tell the parent when the child comes and says, I want to identify as my op, as a other sex. School systems are, are, are taking parental authority. Radicals have hijacked the American school system. Next slide. The press creates a world of illusion that we think is real. Next slide. Lion marker the soul of America unrestricted abortion. Now they want to kill him at on the day of birth. And they don't know what a baby is. When has a woman ever been pregnant with anything other than a baby? Say they don't know when life starts. Why is that important? If the woman is pregnant, <laughs> what does it matter when the life starts? In actuality, According to the scripture, the life started before the woman got pregnant. Because God said, I knew you before. Next verse. Here's what we get as a result. Families are continuously breaking down. 
we have what we call family complexity. What is family complexity? You fly over this great city. The city planners have determined the setback on the houses. Any planned neighborhood, they tell you you gotta be so many feet back from the road. The houses are perfectly lined. The association tells you how many trees you gotta plant. Cut your grass. <laughs> Y'all hear me? It looks so unique and so neat from, from up there. But when you get down here, and you say, who live in that house? Well, I got a brother that lives about, you know, two doors down. And I got a half brother that lives. And I think, I think. <laughs> are y'all, y'all believe me? Uh, I got multiple grandmothers now. Multiple granddaddies. See, family complexity. Houses perfectly lined in order, but the folk in the house are out of order. And hearts are broken. Little boys are suffering from father hunger, longing, causes them to failure to actualize as children, makes them mad and angry. Even in school, got to try to make drugs at them to control them. And, they, and, and my mama would never have let them do that to me. She would have tanned me and said, boy, you ain't going to be able to sit down. And I wouldn't have needed no drugs. <laughs> but they tied our hands and told us that if we whip them, they're going to be violent. But they're violent without us whooping them. I, I, I just Look at what's happening. The genocide, 60 million babies have been murdered. 60 million people. Because our families are weak. Because daddy is not there. Because daddy, uh, you, you got to go through daddy to get to my daughter. You can't hardly make my daughter like that unless you get through me. We got to restore this. We can't, we, can't, we can't fix it without fighting for it. I'm trying to finish here. How about the high rate of incarceration of, black, of young blacks? Where are the women? Where are the men? Where are they? Young, young black girl today is in trouble trying to find a man. What about the persistence of poverty among women and children? How about the growing violence and fear of premature death through failure to protect our families and our children are being shot down and that's why this program is necessary. But the root problem is the family. The root problem is every child God intends to have a mom and a dad home protecting them, nurturing them. We don't need no mentors when we got daddies. A mentor is the world's substitute for a daddy. And a mentor would never be able to do what a daddy does because a mentor can never lay his hand on that child and pass on a blessing. You hear what I'm saying? I'm going to stop right there. I think I've taken up enough of your time. But I want to say this, and I believe it's in the depths of my heart, Elder. I believe that just as Birmingham was the epicenter of the civil rights movement that changed our nation. It changed where I lived. It, it brought racial relationships to the forefront of our nation. It affected Washington, D.C. It touched the president. It caused the Civil Rights Act to be passed. But that was a battle for that time. That was a battle for civil rights. That was the right to have a job and frequent places that other folk could frequent, all of that. That was our struggle at that time. And at that time, most of the families, if we would look at it historically, were more intact. The battle that we fight today was not necessarily the foremost battle at that time. 
that battle was heated. That battle required some people to give up their lives. There were bombings of churches, and I think you survived one of them. That was a day. That was an era. And that was a noble fight and a needed fight because it touched the heart of our nation, both black and white. And, it, and the extremists, the extreme whites, the, 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 what they call the, uh, the superior whites, the, what they call the su white supremacists, they needed to be touched. They needed to be controlled. But all whites went that way. Many whites entered into the civil rights fight along with us. That's how we obtained, that's how, we, 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 that's how slavery was brought to an end. They were white dying with us, good men. And that was needed. But now the era is we're living in a time of our own undoing. We're living in a time when, when I stood today by, beside a man that has 250 some acres of land and built a $17 million church. And I'm a little boy from Green Street. And I sit there and look at him in the eye and say, this is my friend. How do we do that? We did that because America allowed us to do it. Because we embrace God's way and God's standards. We became moral. We lived in the fear, fear of God. Today, we, we can do what we want to do, except uh, uh, so often what we want to do is selfish. And, 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 and our, our favorite, uh, Lord, I'm going to get in trouble now. But our favorite political party tells us your problem is them other people. No, our problem is that we're not building our homes. That, that, we are, that we are hurting ourselves, that we are shooting ourselves in the foot, that we have the power, that you have the power. God gave us the power. And he said, if you do that which is good, uh, you eat the good of the land. He'll bless you and no man can curse you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. If you stay with me, I'll let you say to the mountain, be removed. And to the tree, be plucked up. Nobody will be able to stand in your way to resist you. That's what God said. But it, when we're going to break his rule, break his laws, live any kind of way we want to, and then we'll not take responsibility for it, but then turn around and try to blame others, we make ourselves victims. Mm -hmm. What CFAD is saying, we're powerful. What CFAD is saying, that look, take any family, I don't care who it is, and give me 18 years and I'll turn you out a successful family that's on top of the world. All I need, give me one of your little boys, let me get him in Bishop's Church let me nurture him in the word of God. Let him, let him teach him moral character. And I guarantee you, I don't care what his daddy did or his mama did, he'll take that family and establish them on another foundation. But give me a 10-year-old and I'll do it in eight. God said I can turn any family around in less than 18 years if you would just isolate them, separate them, sanctify them from the mind of this world and put them in my word and I'll give you back something that you'll be proud of. God bless you tonight. I'm done. Well, just in the matter of closing, as we get ready to, we're going to be back in here. Uh, in 12 hours, <laughs> it'll be 9 o'clock in the morning. As a student of history, and one that, when I turned away from the Lord, started studying other things and believing that actually at one point Satan was stronger than God, because I turned away, and some of you all know my story, I turned away. I'm remembering what, I can't 
can't call him a great person because people get offended about it, but he was, he was smart. Um, it was because I studied him. And he knew if I can get the children. And I guess, I mean, see, Satan has always gone after our children. But in 1933, Adolf Hitler came to power. And he started what was called the Hitler Youth. And he started training the young folk in 33. And then in just a few years, 33, and he got them, like, in the next few years, he affected their minds. They began to see themselves as a master race. And he was able to get them to believe they could do all things with their faith in him. And he cast us into a world war. By 1939, I think it was 33 when he came to power. He was voted into power by his people. But I realized that taking the children and getting the minds of the children, you can change the destiny of a nation. Pharaoh knew that, and he was going to take the children, and he was going to see to the death of the children because he knew these Hebrews, if we don't do something about it, kill the children. The children are the key to our future. We have got to restore our families, and we've got to restore the family so that our young children can know what's going on. It hadn't been a long time since we started breaking down the family, and, 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 this, and breaking down the family has broken down our communities. These kids are looking for families out there when they get part of a gang. They find a family because they don't have a family. We've got to restore the family if we're going to bring our country together because if we don't deal with the youth, then they're going to deal with us later on. What is the thing when you kill the older folk? They're doing it in Canada right now. They're setting it up. It's better euthanasia. And they're, and they're doing that. And we're the ones that are going to be affected by because we don't get the minds of these young kid, children now. We've already told them it's okay to kill them before they get born. And this generation is going to come up. And they're going to say, when they get older, it's the time you need to kill them because it's cheaper to kill them than it is to keep them alive. You know that's right. You get to a certain point, you got to go to the hospital, you're going to be in the hospital. And, and Canada, the Canadian government is already trying to encourage that. We've got to begin to affect the minds of the young people. Again, I'm going to say, God's going to touch somebody in this room. Somebody's going to join with me. We're going to work together with, with Apostle Quick. And we're going to grab hold of what the enemy's been trying to do. We're going to realize we've got to go back to the family. And maybe when I saw him and put that, that little chart up there, and I realized at the top that you can go to that top and come down, but when you get to the top, you've got to be wise enough to realize you need to start another level. And, and then there's going to be another level, and Pastor Jim needs to understand. You start here, you get to that level, and there's going to be a decline. But I see what the, God, what the Lord is saying to me with a new vision, a direction to move in. Listening to him, you move to another level. So you get this peak. You start here, but you got another one that goes here. If you don't get the new vision of what God is saying, you don't listen, then you go down. And that's what happens in the, the birth of a church to the death of a church. But you got to move on and follow God because God doesn't do the same thing that he used to do. He said, behold, I'm doing a new thing. And we got to be alert to what that new thing is. And in this generation, for such a time as this, we've got to go back to the family and re-strengthen the family and build it the way God said because the devil is trying to destroy it. In so many different ways. But I'm believing I'll just do it this way. Father, as we conclude tonight, over the next few hours, speak to the people in this room. Speak to the ones that have watched this and who will see it even when we put it up out there again on the internet tonight. Speak to them. Some are going to come in the morning and they're going to hear your voice 
and you're going to raise up someone that's listening right now that's going to come alongside and say, Bishop Lowe, we're going to partner with you. We want to work with you. We're going to work with Apostle Quick. We're going to build Christian families that are going to be Christian families that are going to come together and come and deal with the destructive decisions that the world's trying to encourage us to do. Let's work together. Let's combine. Let's begin to take a stand for such a time as this. Let's each apply ourselves to the purpose you've called us to. We will be Christian families against destructive decisions. We will hold fast to the word of God, and the word of God will teach us the truth, and the truth will make us free. We will not be falling down and dying. We will rise up, and we will rebuild. We will restore the foundations that are being destroyed. Father, speak to them. Speak to them. Somebody you're leading tonight. Someone's going to hear your voice tonight. Someone's going to realize that there's a purpose for them. They don't know which way they're going any more than I do. But even in their life, some of them have already peaked to the point of maturity, and they're looking for the next vision. You're going to give it to them. And this is about being family and moving forward, guiding light, the light and family. And they are going to embrace this vision that I'm presenting to them now. And they come to a certain point, and they're about to go to another level. It's not over. Many have felt like, I don't know what I'm going to do from here, but they're going from this point to another level, just like it was. We don't know where we're going, but we know that where we go, he's going to be with us. Told Abraham, go. Go where? Just go. I will show you when you go. So there will be those that will join with me. And we will be together and we will unite as the family of God and we will restore our families. We will be known Christian families against destructive decisions. In the name of Jesus, everyone pray tonight and let God lead you. We'll see you back here in 12 hours. And go tell somebody else, go share what you got out there tonight. It's on there. Go share it on your Facebook page. I will put it on YouTube. It will be out there also. Go pray. Let's get together. Let's take back our neighborhood, y'all. Okay, God bless you all. We'll see you in the morning.